in the early 1930s, Henry Cartier-Bresson, that legendary photographer, was standing behind the Gare Saint-Lazare and watching people try to jump over a puddle, no doubt, trying to keep their shoes clean and dry before they got on the train. And in one split second, he raises his camera to his eye and he trips the shutter. And forever captured in mid-flight is this gentleman, not quite across the puddle, not in the water, but suspended there, like a ballerina, echoing the ballerina on the poster behind him. Had Cartier Brisson taken that picture, a fraction of a second later, the man's foot no doubt would have ended up in the puddle, breaking the suspense. If he'd taken it a bit earlier, the photograph wouldn't happen because the man wouldn't be in mid-leap. So how do we get this in our own photographs? How's it, how's it? The decisive moment has been talked about at length. And I first came across it when I was you know, learning photography. And to begin with, I thought it was all about luck. That Cartier Brisson and all the other greats of photography who managed to capture this somehow elusive moment were simply lucky. And of course, that's not the case at all. Because if they were lucky, then, well, Cody Brisson must be the luckiest photographer in the world. And my journey to becoming a little bit more comfortable with the decisive moment really came about when I, I was working a lot as a wedding photographer. It was something that I kind of started growing into. And to begin with, I've sort of machine gunned my way through weddings. I wasn't really paying attention to anything like timing. I was just kind of reacting to things and often missing the moment. So what could have been a pretty good photograph just became a pretty average image. So it gave me the idea that timing is, it was super important. And I was working in the theatre at the time and, and timing in that regard was also really, you know, really vital. So it was good for me to take some of these ideas and learn that there are things that happen in front of you know, you, when you're at a wedding or with a street photography, that if you are open to them, you can start to get a sort of a spidey sense tingling about what is going to arrive. When you look at street photographers, they seem to have an almost supernatural way of just getting in the place at the right time. And I believe a lot of that is because they have, over the years, practiced the anticipation and the timing of knowing when it's just right to take the picture. One of the great things that helped me with, with learning this idea of timing was not having to worry about fussing with my camera. You know, I, I tried to kind of keep it simple. The more that I kept things simple in terms of technical aspects, the easier it was for me to concentrate on what was going on in front of me. I would go to a wedding and if I had the moments and the times, I would walk around in the places where we were going to be and get a feel for what the light was like, what it was going to look like over here. How was the place looking? So I wasn't having to think about those aspects of, of, of the photography when I was in there taking the pictures. It worked so well for me because it meant that I could just put that thing to one side. And, and that really took some of the shackles off to allow you know, me to kind of start getting a better grip on that timing. Henry Cartier-Bresson and many other photographers over the years have used Leicas. And in Bresson's case, you know, it was a little tiny camera and he was working often at the beginning of his career alongside other photographers who would walk around the street with giant, you know, speed graphic pictures, the big plates and those flash bulbs and all that sort of stuff. So you can imagine how unobtrusive Henri Cartier-Bresson became when he was using this tiny little camera. You know, people wouldn't give him much of a second glance, I would have imagined. And there's a story, I don't know how true it is, but he would use a little handkerchief. You know, he would drape his camera with a little, not a yellow handkerchief, but and like, hold it up there and would, would sneeze, apparently, when, when he tripped the shutter so nobody would know what was going on. I love this idea. There's always this subterfuge happening. But it goes to show that you need to be 
you know, aware. When I was doing those weddings, I'd started off because I wanted to be seen as a photographer. I, you know, I had the EOS 1DS and big lenses and a flash gun up the top there and I had two bodies. And it's, it's like, you might as well just wear a big neon hat. This is photographer on top of it. And that ends up getting people to react to you. I don't want people to react to me. I don't, you know, I didn't want to walk around having people put up their barriers. We need people to just be themselves, to let life play out. And once I started paring down on my equipment, once I stopped behaving like a photographer and more like a guest with a camera, working on that anticipation, working on the timing, and not just holding the camera up to my face the whole time, but standing, you know, just kind of looking, not making any particularly great movements, and just bringing it up, snap, and it is done. That helped so much. Being unobtrusive, blending in. Even Kenny Ricardo Brisson talked about you know, a velvet eye and a hawk's glove, or a hawk's eye and a velvet glove, and that's. What a wonderful thing to think about, that you need to have that hawk's eye. You need to be there the whole time watching, but not snatching at the photograph. You need to just gently pluck it as it happens. Alongside being unobtrusive, when I look at Henry Cartier-Bresson's photographs, I get the impression that he found a place where there could be a great photograph to be taken. And he worked that area until everything kind of aligned and he got the, you know, that decisive moment to happen. And I would do similar things in the wedding photography that I would, you know, in addition to going around checking out the lighting and things like that, is to find places that you go, wow, this could make a really good photograph. That I'd be, oh, I like this and I like that, but it needs somebody, it needs something. So in the back of my head, there was not only a stock of technical aspects that I'd already kind of mostly taken care of, but also places where I thought, well, I will go and I will try and see what's going on. I'd already re kind of pre-composed the photographs. And when you look at, you know, Henry Cartier-Bresson's images, that there, you, I definitely get that feel. There's a way of, you know, having a stage where you have the people in front of you and they're playing out their little lives, their play to give you that single moment. Next time, you know, I was out there, rather than just wandering around aimlessly, I would go and shoot with purpose. Henry Cartier Brisson, at least to my knowledge, never really talked about using your ears. As a, as, a, as a tool in helping to get a, a, a you know, photograph that just, is, just captures a moment. And I was told this by a great photographer who's, who imparted so much knowledge to me, a guy called Stephen Taylor from, well, he's actually from Suffolk originally, but he lives in Scotland now, I think. Uh, and if Stephen, you watch the channel, well, shout out to you. And he talked about using your ears, specifically at weddings, because obviously there's a lot that goes on around behind you. And, but it ties into being aware of the things that are happening all around. The moments that I think define a great photograph feel like they've, they've been, they've come from somewhere else. And one of the, the things, when you listen, you are drawn towards commotion. You can hear people laughing. If there's a lot of laughing going on, there's something going on that way. If there's a commotion, What's going on down there? Maybe there's a chance for a photograph. It's so often overlooked using your ears to try and take photographs that I really, it was probably, that was probably one of the greatest things that I, I learned in the last sort of 10 years is just to listen. If I were to give myself some advice about finding a way to capture the decisive moment in a sense that kind of you know worked for me then I would certainly go back to my younger self and say look go and stand on a corner take a leaf out of Joel Meyerowitz's book and just watch people come and go ebb and flow think about what they're doing learn to anticipate 
movements. Don't just stand there fiddling with your camera, chimping the whole time. Sit, watch, observe, listen. And that way you're going to end up with images that may be few in number, but you're going to have a, a larger chance of, of images that are at that peak of, of happening that set them apart. And don't be worrying about how many just don't happen or whatever. It's so easy for you to sit and think, oh, gee, there's a body of work here. These guys were just lucky the whole time because we're looking at the, the selections of the work. Mistakes happen. Things don't always go to plan. The best way to improve your decisive moment abilities is to just get out there to photograph, to use anticipation, to use your ears, to be unobtrusive and to set the stage on the, where these photographs can play out. John Meyerwitz is a fantastic photographer and if you're not familiar with his work, you're in for a rare treat. So check out this video over here. Thank you ever so much for watching and I will see you again soon.